It looks like most of you are here. So let's get started. Um, welcome, I'm Anne. I work here at the Arboretum along with your presenter, Liz. Um, Liz joined us um, last year as our curatorial intern and um, she is now our plant recorder. Um, she's decided to stay and we're so glad. Um, prior to the pandemic, we had planned for Liz to present this as an in-person workshop, which would have been really cool, but she graciously agreed to turn it into an online presentation for us. So we are excited to have her sharing this cool technique that she knows a lot about. <laughs> um, so Liz, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn my video off and turn it over to you, but I just want to let everybody know um, you are welcome to type questions as you think of them in the chat or Q&A. We'll probably wait for most questions unless it's just a quick clarification until the end. And then um, we'll save a few minutes for Liz to try to answer some of your questions, but feel free to type them in as they come to you. Um, and it looks like someone's raising their hand, so I'm gonna see. If you have something you wanna say, type it into the Q&A down at the bottom of the screen or the chat. If you don't see that, you can hover your mouse over um, the bottom of your screen and it should show up. Or tap your screen if you're on a mobile device and it should show up if you've got any questions or comments. All right. I think we're set. So Liz, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Anne. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, as you know, I'll be talking about botanical dyes. And there are so many angles to talk about botanical dyes. Um, it is basically an inexhaustive subject. And um, I am going to do the best I can to kind of give you an intro and hopefully enough information to get you started on working up if you've never done it before. But even if you have done it before, I think that hopefully there's a few tips that you might be able to pick up in this presentation and use. But um, either way, um, I do want to point out that I'm going to focus on how you can use plants locally around you to make dye. Um, you know, there's a lot of information on there on how to make dye with onion skins and avocado pits and peels, which make awesome dyes and are gateway dyes for a lot of people. Um, there's also botanical concentrates that you can buy out there and use. Um, like there's a lot of tropical barks that you can buy in like a powdered form to use and get sort of instant, really vibrant results. But I think it's cool to focus on what's around us. So that is what we're going to cover today. And it's not um, plants that are just local to the vineyard. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are located on Martha's Vineyard. Um, but are kind of some general ways to think about any sort of plant and how it might be useful. So why local plants? Um, I'm really interested in this concept of having sort of a color vernacular for a place. Um, so much of you know, the things that we own, the food that we eat, doesn't come from our local environment anymore. And there's some sort of disconnect that we have now from our immediate environment. And I just love the process of discovery um, and connection that you can get through this process. And even if it's plants that you already know and that maybe you're already weeding from your garden, just going out there to harvest and use them in this way, I feel like you really learn more about the plant and appreciate them in different ways. Um, it's a really enriching process too. Um, it feels sort of alchemical and, you know, going out there and actually harvesting stuff yourself and then cooking it on the stove and putting the fabric in and 
um, it's all steamy and then you watch the colors sort of transform in the bath and the fabric. It's all kind of magical in a way. And it's really fun to share with other people, um, whether you dye a gift for someone or you actually go through the process with a friend or a family member. And <clears throat> I also like the idea of incorporating it into sort of new traditions that you can have, where instead of, you know, maybe going out and seeing a movie or shopping or having a game night, you can every fall go out and, or every season you can go out and collect things from your garden um, and create, you know, a book of records of everything that was growing in your garden, you know, throughout the seasons that you can flip through. Um, or in the winter time, going out to collect bark to dye with your kids and then, you know, re dyeing it every winter. Um, or dyeing napkins for the Thanksgiving dinner table every year. The options are really uh, infinite. So this is a couple of examples of the infinite options you have of what you can do with fabric that you dye. I am not good at sewing. And once you get the dye bug, you want to dye all the time. But it gets expensive buying, you know, t-shirts and scarves to dye. So I like to buy fabric by the yard. And because I'm not great at sewing, a lot of times I will just um, use it for stuffing and gifts or wrapping presents or tearing it into strips to use as ribbon or um, even, um, I can't think of the word right now, I'm blanking out, but using it in different crafts like you see above, you can do macrame. Um, you don't even have to dye uh, pieces of fabric. You can also do this process with skeins of yarn or you can buy cordage. You can even dye wood, like people will dye wooden beads. So um, you can really let your imagination run wild with what you can do with this skill. There are a few expectations that you should keep in mind when embarking on this process. Um, I know it's the second thing on the list here, but I will just say it now. Check your control issues at the door. I know when I first started, I wanted to make a dye pot and then do a test strip and then give that strip, you know, the time to dye and then see the result before I put a whole shirt in it. But because botanical dyes are really dynamic and complex, you often will not get the same result from the same dye bath, you know, the next day than you did the night before. And the reason for this is, as opposed to um, a synthetic dye that you might buy at the store, botanical dyes are usually made of all different sorts of plant compounds. So there's not just one type of chromophore or whatever the dye pigment um, compound might be. There's usually several of them working together and they all react differently within the dye pot. Um, some of them might be really sensitive to heat. Some of them might react to different mordants um, in different ways you'll find that certain dye baths can produce like three different colors um, just from the same dye bath by um, using different fabrics, different mordants. Um, you know, the first time you dye something, all of one type of plant compound might be taken up. And then the next time you put something in the same dye pot, it picks up something else. So it's a completely different color. And a lot of times it just takes trial and error and um, working with the same plant a lot to see what might happen. Um, as you can see in this picture here, that's one spoonful and you can already see two or three different colors just in that one spoon, depending on how the light is hitting it. And that's because there's different compounds in that pot. Um, also warning, it's a highly addictive hobby. So this is an example of checking your control issues at the door. And this is a scarf that I dyed for someone 
And as I was ironing it out, you can see in this top picture to the right, it looks a lot more pink than it does on the left, or it's like a cooler pink. And that just started happening while I was steam ironing it. So it could be that the pH of the water in the steam iron or whatever, um, somehow maybe like the metal of the iron was reacting with the botanical dye. I'm not really sure, but if you get into this as a hobby, stuff like this is gonna happen to you all the time. So you really need to expect the unexpected. And this is an example also of what your house might look like in the near future if you get really into this. Um, lots of messes, but again, it's just so much fun and super worth it. But if you have a roommate, they might not like it. So first I will cover fabric. And um, depending on what results and colors you're going for, fabric is an important choice. And with botanical dyes in general, it's important because you really want to use natural fibers only. And the reason for this is a lot of synthetic fibers, um, they don't have points on them for the dye to bind to, and they're pretty inert. And um, you might notice this, that a lot of rugs, if you like spill a glass of wine on it, you can actually wipe it up really easily. And that's because they don't take up stains easily, a lot of these synthetic fabrics. And natural fibers definitely react differently to the same dyes. So you can dye cellulose fibers like cotton, linen, and hemp, but they are not going to dye as vibrantly as protein fibers. And the reason for this is a lot of botanical dyes um, are ionic and it's just harder for cellulose to bind to these dyes because they don't have the same binding sites that proteins do. So silk, wool, fur, hair, et cetera, um, just will pretty much always die more vibrantly than something like cotton will. But cotton can be nice to work with because it's more structurally hardy and, you know, you can kind of forget about your dye pot and realize it's been boiling for an hour and the cotton's going to be fine. Whereas if you have wool in a dye bath, and it's boiling for an hour, um, it might be completely shrunken and also felted. The cotton and other cellulose fibers can also require some extra prep, which I will be getting into in the next slide. Um, and they usually require a mordant, which is something else that I'll be talking about. Proteins like silk and wool, um, often don't actually need a mordant, but mordants are really helpful for the longevity of the dye. And like I said, they dye more vibrantly, but they require a little more care during the actual dyeing process. Plus they're more expensive. So pre-treating fabric. You'll see on the slide here that I have a couple of things bolded. And I bolded these because you should, if you want really good results, to always do it. But that being said, I often don't do this. I'll usually wash everything beforehand, but sometimes I get a bug up my butt and I'm like, I just want to dye right now. So I'll throw, you know, a dry piece into a dye pot. But um, the middle two, for the very best dye results, you want to do these. And especially if you're dyeing um, for a special gift or if you want to sell your products, I would recommend the middle two. So the first thing is you want to wash everything to remove any hidden residues or particles that might have attached to the clothing through the manufacturing process or you know, at the store that you bought them at, sometimes there's still like some industrial sort of preservatives on top to sort of be a stain guard or something. For vegetable fibers, um, this is the extra prep that I was referring to in the previous slide. 
they recommend that you do something called scouring, which you literally boil it on the stove for two hours in a solution of washing soda, which you can find in the cleaning section of stores, and detergent, which you can just use regular dish detergent. Um, and the reason you do this for vegetable fibers is um, plants like cotton actually have like oils and resins and waxes that are coating their fibers. And when you remove them, you will sort of give yourself the opportunity to dye it more evenly and, you know, remove a little bit of a barrier that might help it dye more vibrantly as well. But it does take more energy and more water in the dyeing process, which often doesn't feel good, especially, you know, like you have a gas stove and you feel kind of guilty about running it for two hours, especially when you're going to be running it again later to make more dye. Um, Degumming raw silk is another one. I like to use raw silk. It's a lovely fabric. It dyes so richly and um, it's often less expensive than processed silk. But it does have a natural residue on it. So they say to bring it to just below a simmer for 30 minutes, also with detergent, which again can be something like dish detergent. But I also usually skip this step and it's totally fine. The other thing is soaking your fibers in water for at least an hour before the next step, which is mordantine. And you actually want to soak your fibers in water before every step of the dyeing process. And, you know, if you skipped all of these steps, you're still going to get results and they'll probably be good. But the reason that you want to soak the fiber is it helps the fiber to really fully open up. So again, you will dye more evenly and also maybe a bit more vibrantly. So mordantine, for those of you who don't know, um, it's a term that means like to bite and it helps the dye um, bind to the fabric and it also increases wash and light fastness. And that term fastness just means longevity basically. So something like silk might take up a dye without needing a mordant, but if you do mordant it, it's going to make the color deeper and it's probably going to go hold on to that color better through washing and just exposure to light. And there's different methods for mordantine. You can mordant before, during, after, and there's also something called pot as mordant, which also would be you mordantine during the process. It's most common to mordant before, and that's what I always do. I have done pot as mordant a bit with iron pots. And I don't know many people who mordant after, but you can like dip something, say in iron, which is something I'll cover later, that will help the dye last longer. And using the pot as a mordant basically, um, if you use an aluminum pot or an iron pot, it'll actually put some of those molecules into the water. And so it'll take up that while it's in the dye bath. So they all kind of come together at one time. And it's just, again, a way to preserve water as is mordantine during the dye bath. You can reuse mordant baths. They recommend um, that you just add like maybe a teeny bit more mordant the next time you use it, but I'm going to get to the specifics of all of this coming up. Um, fibers can be mordanted in batches and stored for later use, which is really helpful, and I usually do that. And it is important for the mordant bath to be large enough for fibers to move around freely. And basically that just means you don't want it all to be crammed into the bath because the parts of the fabric that are folded in on itself are not going to pick up as much mordant, even though it seems like, oh, it all gets soaked in, whatever. It's actually not true. And I've had things mordant unevenly just because I maybe didn't have enough water or I didn't um, stir it around enough times through the process to sort of get an even distribu <clears throat> distribution. So, 
you have a few different options for Mordentine. And I want to point out that Mordentine is pretty dang important to this whole process. So it's important to pay attention to what I'm going to cover here. And we can also send you these slides afterwards because I don't expect you to be able to listen and write it down and remember. So alum, iron, tannin, and soy are all used as mordants or binders for attaching the dye to fabric. Alum is most commonly used and it's used in two different forms. There's aluminum sulfate or potassium aluminum sulfate You'll also see it called aluminum potassium sulfate, and it's all basically the same thing, except that potassium aluminum sulfate and aluminum potassium sulfate are generally a little bit more pure than regular aluminum sulfate. And so you don't have to worry about there maybe being a little bit of iron in there, which will skew your results. And <clears throat> the alum that's in the spice section, like McCormick's alum, is actually potassium, potassium aluminum sulfate. So it's pretty accessible. Um, but, you know, it's usually only sold in small amounts. And if you're going to be doing a lot of dye, it does help to buy a larger amount that's a little bit more economically priced. And you're going to use potassium aluminum sulfate for protein fibers specifically. You can also use it for cellulose fibers, but because of the chemistry, you have to do this whole other step first, which is processing and dipping it in tannin, which is easy, but again, it's just more time and more water. And so it's just easier when you're mordantine cellulose fibers to use aluminum acetate instead. And when you use aluminum acetate, you can completely skip the tannin step. So I don't really cover the whole tannin dip and then aluminum sulfate step because I just don't personally don't think it's worth it. Um, but that's something that you can look into if you're into that idea. And aluminum is used as a mordant if you want your colors to be bright and warm. If you're looking for maybe um, a darker, moodier sort of color, then you can mordant with iron. And so iron mordants are in the form of ferrous sulfate. And you can either buy it as a powder or you can actually make your own, which I have done, by dissolving something like nails or steel wool <clears throat> in a jar of vinegar. And it takes a while like it'll take you know a couple months but it eventually turns like a rusty orange color and then it's obviously difficult to sort of measure how much you have and you have to kind of just like play it by ear and experiment but it's totally doable and one issue with iron is it can weaken some protein fibers over time particularly wool I've used it on silk a lot, not as a mordant, but as a modifier, which is something that I'm also going to cover later. But um, iron mordantine is a little bit of a quicker process too. So that's another reason you might use it instead of alum. Tannin, um, I never really use. I've used it a bit in the past, but I feel like it can make the colors sort of dull. It's not as wash and light fast as the other um, metal mordants are. And it also tends to add sort of a base color, which might be another reason that it makes the other colors dull. And for a tannin mordant, you can either make it yourself using acorns or um, sumac leaves or oak leaves, anything that has a lot of tannin in it, you can basically, as if you were making a dye bath, make a tannin bath and um, just soak your fabric in it. You can also buy tannin powder. Um, so that's always an option. And then a lot of people like to use soy as a mordant. And I didn't, I was very skeptical about soy as a mordant, and technically it's not, it doesn't act the same. Well, 
It acts similarly to a mordant, but it's not technically a mordant, it's a binder. And that difference is because a mordant actually chemically bonds the dye to the fabric, whereas soy is more like a glue that sticks to the fabric and sticks the dye to the fabric. So I've heard some people claim that they think that soy is just as, if not more, wash fast than alum. I haven't personally found that to be the case, and I get really inconsistent results with soy. I find that sometimes I like the color better, but a lot of times it just is kind of like a dirty, muddy color that I don't appreciate. And it's also a much more involved process. So you can either use soy milk bought from the store or you can make your own, which is more potent by buying dried soybeans and soaking them and then blending them and straining it. And basically what you do is you immerse your fabric into the soy milk, you let it sit overnight, and then you squeeze it out, let it dry, then when it's dry, you re-dip it, squeeze that out, let it dry, re-dip it again, let it dry, and then you just leave it like that until you're ready to use it. So another option for those of you who are interested in that. One thing that I do like about soy though is you can actually use it like almost like a paint on fabric. So if you um, do an alum mordant and then paint a design on it with soy milk, it'll actually dye slightly differently and kind of show a pattern, which is cool. So when you use your alum mordant and your iron mordant, for both of them, you're first gonna dissolve the powder in a small amount of boiling water. And then you're gonna add that to your larger pot of water. When I mordant, I always use just like a large um, stainless steel stock pot. And you're basically gonna fill it up with water, leaving room for whatever fabric you're, fabric you're gonna put in. And I find that a half pound of fabric generally fits with enough room in one stock pot. So for um, alum mordant for protein, I find that eight teaspoons for a half a pound of fiber in one big stock pot is what I usually end up doing. But here I gave you some measurements that you can use so you can kind of tweak it um, depending on how much fabric you're doing. So um, for protein fabrics, which you're going to use the aluminum sulfate, you're going to do two teaspoons per four ounces of fiber. And for cellulose fibers, with the aluminum acetate, acetate you're going to do 2.5 teaspoons per four ounces of fiber. So once you um, add your dissolved mordant into your bigger stock pot, you're going to add the fibers you're going to simmer it for an hour and then you're going to turn off the heat and leave it in the solution for at least a couple of hours or overnight and then once it's cool you're going to rinse it and then you can use it immediately or you can store it for later there's also a cool method that you can do with silk but you have to leave it in there definitely for sure overnight and you'll see a lot of people suggest using cream of tartar as an assist. And they'll recommend doing one and a half teaspoons of aluminum sulfate with um, some cream of tartar added for protein fibers. But I have found that I actually get worse results when I use a cream of tartar. And I've talked to some other people online who have the same thing happen. So I generally don't recommend it. And if you're going to do an iron mordant, you do the same process um, <clears throat> of dissolving the mordant, adding it to the big pot, but you're going to simmer it for 30 minutes, and then you want to remove the fibers and rinse them immediately instead of letting them sit in there to cool overnight. So these two pictures show an example of 
the importance of choosing the correct mordant for what you want to do, or at least shows you how different mordants and different fabrics can give you different results from the same dye. So the actually neither of these <laughs> are from local plants, but they just kind of show my point. Um, the top photo is a logwood dye bath, and it was all the same dye bath, but some of them are cotton, some of them are silk, and there's a couple of different mordants or no mordant being used, and you can see there's like pretty dramatic differences. The bottom one is a matter dye bath, <clears throat> and the bottom layer is all silk, and the top layer is all cotton, and they all have different mordants. So I know that um, the one on the bottom left is alum, and then I think the one next to that, I actually did silk or um, soy on silk because I was curious. And then the one next to that is not mordanted, and then the one next to that was iron mordanted, and the one above that was soy. Um, so yeah, you just. It takes trial and error to really see what it's going to do. This also can show you the difference between mordantine and non-mordantine, and I wanted to include these photos because it also shows how different your dye products can look depending on the light and how freaking hard it is to get accurate pictures of your dyed products. And um, I've actually, all the photos that I'm using in this presentation are all things that I've dyed. And the reason for that is I just don't trust the pictures that I see on the internet. A lot of times people post pictures and you can tell they either hadn't rinsed it yet or it's still wet, which really changes how the color looks. And depending on the light and the background that they took it in, it can look completely different. So I just wanted to know that I was showing you guys the most accurate information as possible. So this was a hibiscus dye, and the one in the back had no mordant, the one in the front did have mordant, and they were also done with different water sources. So I had a well, my friend had city water, and depending on the pH of your water, which is something that I'll also cover later, you can get different results because a lot of dyes are pH sensitive. So, making dye. We've made it to this point. Um, so, it's important to point out that there is no set rule for anything when it comes to doing botanical dyes, and these are all gross generalizations, but <clears throat> you've got to have some sort of reference point, and there are definitely many exceptions to every rule. But if you're working with a plant that you don't really have a lot of information about how it dies, these are good guidelines to follow. So for woody materials like um, bark, for instance, you want to break it down into smaller pieces first and let it soak, maybe even for a few days. That way you won't have to boil it as long to get the dye to extract, and it kind of helps it break down a little bit easier. And once you've done that, you want to do a long simmer um, to extract as much dye as possible. For a lot of flowers, you want to avoid boiling and sometimes even simmering because the compounds, the dye compounds that are in the flowers are often sensitive to heat and can break down more easily that way. And for everything else, like if you're using leaves or roots that aren't too woody or stems, just put them in some water, bring them to a simmer, and maintain until your desired color is reached. And a lot of this, you have to kind of just play it by ear and just watch the pot and you can kind of get a feel for, okay, you know, within half an hour, there was a big difference from like the first five minutes to 30 minutes into how much color is in the pot. But then 10 minutes after that, it hasn't really changed much. So you're probably towards the end of what you're gonna get. 
But because botanical dyes are so dynamic, sometimes if you let a dye sit for a few hours, it'll actually start changing color a bit as the compounds sort of go through like hydration reactions or oxidation reactions or other random reactions that they go to now that they're outside of the plant. So it's just something that you have to play around with. And I'm gonna sort of cover some of the different compounds a little bit later so you can like maybe have an idea of how to approach certain plants when you're using them. And um, let's see here, I'm gonna go back a little bit, okay. So when you make your dye, you're gonna, like I said, you know, probably simmer your plant material until you've got it to a color that seems right. And then it's good to strain it out because you're gonna get a bunch of little pieces stuck into your fabric if you don't, especially if you're working with a knit or something like wool that has a lot of loose fibers. So it's really handy to have another pot ready and a strainer and even cheesecloth, depending on what you're working with. Like this pot is a pot of goldenrod and all those teeny little flowers might go through the strainer and still get stuck into your fabric. So once your dye is ready, like sure, if you're just testing something out and you don't really care, and I do this all the time, you can just throw your fabric right into the dye pot with the plant materials and it's not gonna hurt anything and it's not gonna affect the dye probably. But it'll probably be a neater process if you strain it out. So now, dyeing your fiber. And I should have mentioned this when I talked about mordantine, but for wool, it's really important that whenever you're gonna put it in a bath of any kind, that you start out with room temperature, liquid because when wool goes through extreme temperatures in water it causes it to felt so for wool you have to let your dye bath come to room temperature before putting your fabric in but for most other fibers you can add it to the dye bath immediately and you can either do that straight from mordantine it when it's still wet from that and if it's something that you've pre-mordanted then it's best to pre-soak. But like I said, I oftentimes just want to be spontaneous and dye something right away. So I'll throw something dry in there and it's fine. It's gonna die. It just might die a little unevenly. Um, so once you have your fiber in there, you're generally gonna keep the fiber in the hot dye bath either at a simmer or depending on the dye and your fabric, a little bit below a simmer for as long as suitable, which for me is often like an hour or two and then I'll turn it off and let it sit overnight. That's almost always what I do actually, but it's really dependent again on the dye. If it's something that's gonna keep reacting with water, and I don't want it to turn whatever that color is eventually, then I'll take it out sooner. As you work with dyes, you kind of get a sense just from what the dye looks like in the pot and how it compares to other dyes that you've used or if it's something that you've used before, that what you have after a couple of hours is what it's gonna be, whether you leave it in all night or not. But for dyes that take a little bit longer to bind, then it is better to leave them in overnight, but it almost never hurts to leave it in overnight if you can have the patience for that. And you can leave it in longer too if you want. Again, it just really depends on the dye and it's often something you just have to kind of feel out. Um, but one thing that I've underlined that's really important to keep in mind is fibers will always dry to a lighter shade. So if you're looking at it and you're like, ooh, I wanted something, you know, a little subtler in color. I'm not looking for this like punch you in the face yellow. Just keep in mind that it's gonna dry several shades lighter than it looks when it's wet. So you wanna leave it in a little bit past the point 
that it looks to be the shade that you're shooting for. So some tips. I mentioned that for a lot of flowers, and this doesn't just go for flowers, um, but for heat sensitive materials that are also like succulent, you can sort of do a hack where you freeze them ahead of time. That way, when they come up to temperature, all of those cells are breaking open and releasing the dye without you even needing to heat it. So whether you then still heat it a little bit or not, it allows you to extract more dye from those flowers. And it's also helpful when you're doing bundle dyeing, which I'm gonna cover after this. And it's also a way that you can sort of preserve flowers from your garden or from a meadow to use during the winter time or other times of the year. You can also dry plant materials and use them for dye. And, um, you know, the, bi the dye might be a little bit less vibrant, but it'll definitely still work in a lot of cases. You can combine colors by over dyeing um, or even combining different plant material within the same dye bath. So if you have um, a few different plants that produce a source of yellow that you kind of want to mix up and see if you can get something different than the norm, you can totally do that. You can also, like I said, you can combine colors by over dyeing. So if you get something that you feel like is a little too bright and happy, then you can over dye it with something that's more of an earth tone to sort of tone it down. This picture here, um, I actually dyed the scarf with fall leaves and then over dyed it with a little bit of matter root. So that's another way that you can kind of like still have a sense of place but also work with fun botanical extracts. Um, as I mentioned before too, because oftentimes dye will change while it's in the dye pot over time, you can keep reusing the same dye bath to get different results on purpose. And even if you don't want like a crazy color change, you can, you know, still reuse it to get a lighter shade of maybe a deeper color that you did. And you can store the dyes that you make by just putting a little bit of alcohol in the dye in a jug and they'll keep, I mean, I've had dyes for over a year that didn't get molds and were still usable. This might not work with certain dyes that um, have hydration reactions, but again, this is just something that you'll learn as you go along and there's not really a set rule for any of this or else I would tell you. Also, one thing that I forgot to mention is when it comes time to harvesting materials to dye with, there's a general rule where they say, use two times the weight of the dry fabric um, in dye stuffs to make the dye, but that is just a gross overgeneralization because um, it really depends on how potent of a dye source it is. And, um, you know, what you're using. So, it's another thing that I feel like is just intuitive where obviously the more dye stuff that you harvest and put into a volume of water, the deeper it's going to be. And if you're doing something like cotton, then you want to have as saturated of a dye bath as possible just because it, it does dye less vibrantly. So it's just something that you'll, you'll get a hang of and I think is intuitive and you'll get as you go along. So bundle and imprint dyeing. If you have Instagram and you've been interested in botanical dyeing up to this point, then I'm sure you've seen many drool worthy pictures of imprint and bundle dyes. And they are super fun. It is totally possible that you will get disappointing results sometimes. 
it happens to everyone who even does this all the time. Even professionals um, will still sometimes get disappointing results when they do bundle dyes. But when you get great results, it is so worth it. And again, it just comes down to how much you're experimenting versus how much you're using tried and true um, dye potent materials. So when you do a bundle or an imprint dye, instead of making a dye bath that you sort of soak your fabric in, you actually place the dye stuffs directly onto the fabric and then steam it. Iron is often used either as an iron blanket or a pre-soak. And again, you can either use the ferrous sulfate powder or you can make your own sort of solution with the um, vinegar and the iron. And um, I'm gonna talk about iron a little bit after this. So, um, basically why people will use iron when they bundle dye is if you're using plant materials that don't necessarily have dye potential, you can usually still get results if you use iron because it will react with any sort of small amounts of tannins or other acids like um, organic acids that are in the plant to either produce an imprint or um, an outline, depending on if you use an iron blanket. What an iron blanket is, is a piece of cloth, or you can even use something like paper towels that you soak in an iron solution and then lay on top of the fabric and the plant material so that you're getting a silhouette of the plant material. And, um, the other way you use iron is if you take the dye stuffs and you soak them in iron before putting them onto the to the fabric. And when you do this, you have the option of adding a boundary layer on top of it so that when you roll it up into a bundle that you're going to imprint. You're not also doing the imprints on the back of the fabric, which depending on how thin your fabric is can kind of create a lot of visual noise. But I feel like I'm getting a little ahead of my stuff, myself here. So I apologize. Let me backtrack a little. Um, so the difference between a bundle dye and an imprint dye. Both of them, you put the dye stuffs directly onto the fabrics, whether that's petals or leaves or bark powder, whatever it is, you put it directly onto your pre-soaked fabric. And if you want to do a bundle dye, you're going to get a sort of a softer, more blended effect. And you're going to basically put your plant material onto the fabric, you're going to roll it up, and then you can, hold on, let me go up a couple slides real quick. You can, this is an example of the bundle dye. You set your plant material on it, roll it up, and then you sort of can spiral it or knot it up into any way that makes sense to you, almost like you're making a tie dye. And then tie it up with string. And then you can either set that in a small amount of boiling water or you can steam it by sticking a wooden spoon through it and putting that over the top of a pot or um, you know I'll even use like chopsticks and stuff like that sometimes or you can put it directly into a steamer basket. There's different ways, all different ways you can do it. Now if you want to be able to actually see sharper outlines of the plant material <clears throat> then you're going to do what's called an imprint dye. And for this, you have to wrap it tightly against a pipe. Otherwise, it's just gonna turn out like a bundle dye. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna lay out your plant material. And then if you're gonna do the iron blanket, you put the iron blanket on top of it. And if you don't want the visual noise created by 
having it sort of imprint onto the back side of itself, then you can put something like parchment paper or just anything that's not going to melt when it's steamed as a boundary layer. And then holding, it's really helpful to have another person there. I usually don't, so I'll just tell you how to do it if it's just you. Um, you're going to want to hold the pipe and you're going to have this all like sitting on a table surface. You're going to put the pipe on top of the fabric all the way at the end. You're going to hold the pipe in your hands on either end and then using your thumbs and like these fingers here, you're going to sort of tightly hold the fabric to the pipe and sort of roll it while keeping it taut and guiding it with your fingers. I was gonna post a video, but a lot of webinars that I've been in have had videos that don't really work, so I didn't do that. But maybe there's something on YouTube, but it's, again, pretty intuitive and you'll figure it out. Um, so you're gonna tie it with string after you have it bound all tight and you're gonna steam it. And the rule is you steam it for an hour and after a half an hour, you sort of flip it to the other side. But you can also steam it for longer than that. And usually they say that you should let it sort of cool overnight before unwrapping it, but I don't think it really matters. So that was the bundle die. Um, here's an example of on the top is a bundle die next to an imprint die. Um, let's see, this bottom photo here is a nine bark imprint. And I realize now that I really need to hurry up and I'm taking way longer than I thought I would. So I'm gonna start breezing through the rest of my slides. Um, this is an imprint die that I did with sumac and some violas from my garden. Um, St. John's wort is an amazing flower to use both as a dye and as an imprint. And the best one to use is um, Hypericum perfoliatum, which is the one that you commonly see growing as a weed, like in meadows, because it has something called hypericin, which is actually in those little black dots that you can see around the petals here. And um, not all species of St. John's wort has the hypericin. And all hypericum species will give you um, like yellowish, green, or brown dyes, but only the ones with hypericin can give you also a red dye. But anyways, I love using St. John's wort as an imprint flower because look how amazing that is. Um, a word of caution, um, to avoid blotches when you're imprint dyeing, this is a little fail picture for you all using sassafras, you really want to pat the excess iron solution from the plant material before setting it onto the fabric. So once you take it out of the, if you do choose to use an iron soak for your plant material that you bundle dye with, you want to pat it dry um, it doesn't have to be completely dry, but you want to pat it down so it's not like dripping wet or else you're going to get these like big old splotches that do not look good. So rinsing and care. Um, once you have finished either with your bundle dye or dyeing in a pot, um, it's best to not rinse it immediately. You want to leave bundles to cool overnight before unwrapping, like I mentioned. Um, fibers removed from a dye pot should be gently squeezed of excess dye and then hung to dry. You could, you know, put them in the in your dryer, I guess, but because you're not going to rinse it right away, you don't want to get dye in your dryer. So let it sit for about a week, just make sure it's not in direct sunlight and then you can rinse it in cool water until it runs clear. And you can totally do this in the rinse cycle if you're washing machine. For future laundering, you want to wash it separate because it might bleed in cool water with a pH neutral detergent. You wanna use a pH neutral detergent 
because as I'm still gonna cover very quickly, I'm so sorry, I'm definitely going over my time. Sorry, I've never done a webinar before. Um, there's a lot of dyes that are pH sensitive. And like I said, always store out of direct sunlight because a lot of botanical dyes are sensitive to photo oxidation. So modifiers, very fun. Um, you can either add them directly to the dye pot or you can apply them afterwards. So we've already talked about iron and iron saddens colors um, or makes them darker and moodier. And not only does it do that, but it can actually completely change colors. So in this picture here, um, this is dyed with goldenrod and all goldenrod species will give you a yellow dye that goes to green. Um, but some things like sumac leaves will go from yellow to purple. It's crazy. Um, copper shifts colors towards green and brown and pH um, for dyes that are sensitive to pH, they can either go from alkal, um, in an alkaline solution, they'll go from yellows to pinks or reds to pink or purple to blue. And in an acidic solution from blue towards purple, towards red, towards orange, towards yellow, depending on what the dye is and how acidic it is. It'll sort of go through those steps. Um, some words of advice about iron. A little goes a long way and it's very easy to overdo it. So always start out using less, just a little bit of iron because once you use too much iron, there's no going back. And I have ruined too many pieces by thinking I'm just gonna modify it in a little bit of iron, but I made my iron solution too strong and um, it just makes it completely purple. And I get so sick of that iron purple. You wanna work with iron last if you're working with several different pieces and gloves are recommended if you're gonna to be touching other fibers because you need to wash your hands really, really well to not have any residue left and you will leave blotches of iron on other things. And if you drip it onto a wood floor, it's gonna react with the tannins to um, turn purple and then you have to use like wood bleach to get it out. And unlike everything else, when you use iron as a modifier, you want to take it out as soon as it gets to the desired shade or even a little bit earlier because it's going to keep getting a little bit darker after you remove it and you want to rinse it immediately and very thoroughly. But a great thing about iron is I have found that it definitely does make things much more longer and light fast. I have a napkin that I had dipped in iron that I have washed a million times in hot water and it is still very deeply colored. So um, iron is great as long as you want a darker color. So the top here is one of my favorite local things to use. It's a privet berry dye. And this is on raw silk. And to the right is it without an iron dip and to the left is with an iron dip. The bottom here is um, acorns. And um, the one at the top is just, you know, mordanted with alum and then dyed in an acorn dye. And then the middle one is left in iron for just, you know, maybe even a few seconds because it can happen really quick. I mean, iron can work and usually does work very, very, very fast. So um, the middle one is taking it out pretty quick. And then the bottom one that's very, very dark is if you let it, if you leave it in for even just a little bit longer, it can be the matter of a difference. And when you make your iron solution um, for a modifier, you can basically just take a little container and whether you use your homemade iron solution or you just like make it up with some iron powder, there's no real recipe. You just, like I said, start with what seems like a dilute solution and then um, you can always add more, but you can't go back. And it really, you don't even have to heat it and you can either dip it in the iron immediately after you dye it while it's still wet from the dye, but after you've like rinsed it, or you can even do it on completely dried 
materials that you've then re-wet. Like even if it's something that you dyed a week ago, you can still do it. Here's an example of pH change. So I had dyed a scarf using violas, which are um, have anthocyanins that I was gonna talk about. I'm hoping to not go more than 10 over. So I have, I'm giving myself about five minutes to rush through everything. Um, so it came out purple, but then when I rinsed it, because most of our water um, is actually alkaline, it shifted it to this blue color. And you can actually shift it back. It's a reversible reaction if you add acid, but then you'd have to use something like vinegar and you don't really want your scarf to smell like vinegar because then you'd have to rinse it again, which would just turn it blue again. So it's just one of those fun little things that happens when you work with botanical dyes. Um, this is the one at the top. I dyed literally with dried up like dead post fall leaves and it made this really nice golden orange dye and it actually makes a prettier dye than um regular like green leaves and so the bottom picture is i folded it up and then i put it into a privet berry dye and um sometimes when you mix when you over dye something it will actually push the other dyes away, which sort of happened here. So you can see that it, it kind of faded the golden dye, but it also created a green dye where <clears throat> the two were like completely on top of each other. So some more tips. This is an important one. Beware of dyeing pre-used fabrics. Any old sweat, or invisible stains that remain will dye darker. So when I first started getting into this, I was like, oh, this is great. I'm gonna go to the thrift store. I'm gonna pick up a few cheap shirts. And I dyed them. And even though you couldn't see anything on the clean shirt, and even though I washed them beforehand, they still had, I guess, invisible pit stains and all of the pits dyed like five shades darker. So if you're gonna wa if you're gonna dye a pre-worn shirt, maybe just like dip the bottom in and don't do the pits. Um, speaking of sweat, don't use a pH sensitive dye on a shirt unless you want the armpits or the back or whatever other area you sweat to literally change color while you're wearing it and show everyone like, hey, look at me, I'm sweating. Um, And plastic food to go containers are really great uh, to save to use for vessels for di um, iron dips and soaps. That way you don't have to use um, what you use for food. And I should mention in general, it's not recommended to use pots that you use for food to make your dye baths in. And it can stain your pots too. So just real quick, um, I'm going to go through, there's so many different plant compounds that can make dyes, and I'm going to touch on them really quickly so that while you're out there looking for plants to use around you, you can maybe have an idea of how they're going to react in a dye bath or what they might be good for. So like I said, um, you don't want a pH sensitive dye on a shirt, so you might want to avoid anthocyanins. So anthocyanins are the main components in a lot of flowers and berries, giving them their colors and are especially like the blue and the purple colors that you see. And they are extremely unstable. So they're some of the most quickly fading dyes because they're sensitive to degradation by heat, light, water, and oxygen. Um, they are very sensitive to pH changes. And um, not all anthocyanins are created equally. So I have dyed with some berries that I'll show you that dyed a really pretty blue right away and then faded to gray like very quickly. But violas have an, an anthocyanin called delphinidum in them that actually lasts a lot longer. And one thing also to keep in mind is that one of the reasons that anthocyanins are so unstable is because they're actually made of a complex 
of different molecules that are not bonded together. They're just sort of associated together. And um, every anthocyanin has like six different forms. And so the cation form is what is in acidic solutions and it is the most stable. So if you are gonna do an anthocyanin dye, you wanna add vinegar to the water to make it in its more, most stable form. Um, so you can do a viola dye and if you, you know, if I had that scarf and I kept it purple, um, or if I added some vinegar to it to make it pink, that pink color will actually last longer than if I had um, left it in a blue form, which is just a lot more sensitive to oxidizing just with oxygen. And the reaction that happens with oxygen when it degrades the blue color is irreversible. But when you have a color change with the cation form, um, it actually is reversible if you just add acid. So if you have a dye bath and you realize that the pink color went away, if you just flash some acid in, it'll come back. Um, and co-pigments enhance the stability of anthocyanins. So if you mix them with a tannin, they might last a lot longer. Um, so privet berry, like I mentioned, is something I love to dye with. It's one of my favorites. And even though it's an anthocyanin, it's one of the more stable ones because it has not faded on me at all. And um, iron really helps it to stick around. So the top is it without iron, the bottom is it with iron. It's more of like a deeper, beautiful, like greener color. And what's great about privet berries is they're an invasive shrub. So um, you don't have to feel bad about harvesting all the berries. This also was an anthocyanin and it was huckleberry at the top, blueberry on the bottom. And the blueberry pretty much just completely went gray immediately. And the huckleberry took about a year, but it's now fully gray. Um, quinones are yellow, browns, and reds. They're found in the roots of the Rubiaceae family. Um, so madder and bedstraw. That's also in black walnut fruits and St. John's wort flowers. So this picture here is of St. John's wort flowers. And you can get a brown dye, a green dye, a red dye from St. John's wort flowers. They're amazing. And these are among the most light fast dyes. So if you're going to be dyeing something that is um, you know gonna be out in the open a lot and not like tucked away in a box or a drawer, maybe choose something that is likely to have quinones in it. Um, carotenoids and quercetin are your reds, oranges, and yellows. And this is marigolds, um, onion skin, uh, goldenrod. They have variable resistance to light, although I've found goldenrod dyes to last pretty well. And they are often reactive to pH and iron modification. So keep that in mind. Um, tannins can be anywhere from light yellow to beige to rosy reddish brown. And um, tannin dyes are one thing that you can use on cellulose fibers without a mordant and you'll be fine. Although I do still recommend a mordant <clears throat> like a a metallic salt mordant to make the color a little bit more vibrant and make it more wash fast. And it's generally not as reactive to pH. So another good option for if you're gonna dye a shirt and you don't want your sweat to show up. Um, this top picture, I actually dyed with weeping willow bark from my yard. And the bottom picture, I used Kusa dogwood bark from the Arboretum. And just a few quick things. Um, I don't like to tell people to go harvest plants for dyes without this very important caveat. If you don't know what it is, please leave it because it might be poisonous or it might be rare. Um, if there isn't much of it, leave it. Even if it's not a rare plant, um, it's just best to leave that population alone because you don't want to eradicate it from a site where it might be um, giving some important ecosystem functions. If it's the only plant flowering late in the fall or early in the spring, leave it for the pollinators. You don't need it to make dye. 
and never harvest more than 10% of a population at a given site. Um, and I feel like this is also a good slide to mention that there's plenty of stuff that you can die with in the winter also because there's a lot of different barks that you can use. You can pick up acorns off the ground. You can use the dried berries that are still on bushes. So even though it's fall now, you still have all fall and all winter to harvest stuff for dye. Um, this picture at the top was made with already dried up brown looking sumac droops that I collected from the town dump. And maybe you can't tell from this picture, but it makes a really actually beautiful <clears throat> coppery sort of dye. And this one at the bottom was made with usnea moss, which is actually a lichen and is very abundant here. And I wouldn't pick it off a tree, but you'll find plenty on the ground after a storm. I can send this all to you because I know you don't have time to read it because I took forever. Um, but these are just some recommended plants that are easy for most people to find around them. Um, and I kind of broke it up by what color you might be going for. So again, um, we can send you this slide. Um, some recommended tools would be strainer, cheesecloth, tongs, because it's really good to move the fabric around while it's in a dye bath, so that, or even in a mordant pot, so that it dyes evenly. Otherwise, no matter how long you keep it in that pot, anywhere where it's sort of folded into itself is going to not pick up as much dye, so it'll be a little blotchy. Um, metal or PVC pipe for imprint dyeing, string for bundle dyeing. Um, you're going to want a scale to measure your fabric. Um, unless you just like want to be a little loose with it, which is also fine. You just want to guesstimate on how much mordant to use. Measuring spoons for the mordant, a drying rack such as this one in this photo, and a notebook so that you can record the results that you've gotten um, depending on what mordants you've used and material. And then these are my favorite resources. Um, you can buy the Mordens at botanicalcolors.com. They also sell dye extracts. Um, Dharma Trading is my go-to place for buying fabric. Again, my favorite fabric to use is silk. They say that, you know, silk will lose its luster if you boil it. I have not found that to be true. Um, if you're in the Northeast, Go Botany is an amazing plant ID site, so you can look up a plant before you harvest it and make sure that you're not harvesting something dangerous or precious. And these two books here are really great. I would particularly recommend the one on the left. There are a lot of really crappy books out there that just repeat a bunch of garbage that doesn't work really well because botanical dye is sort of having a moment right now. Um, but I find wild color on the left to just give really great information um, and really thorough details. So I will end here and I'm really sorry I had to rush through the last half of that. But like I said, we can send you guys any slides that you want and I am also here to answer any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Liz. Yes. That was excellent. Really interesting presentation. Wonderful photos. Um, I know I'm inspired to give it a try. And I appreciate your encouragement to have an experimental attitude about it. That seems like good advice, especially yeah. for newbies. Um, and to all of you who are watching, I can attest I've seen some of Liz's fabric creations in person and they are beautiful. Um, so if anybody's got questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A now. Um, I also wanted to point out real quick, because I don't think I did, that in this picture, just because I'm literally obsessed with St. John's wort dye. Um, oops, darn it, hold on. Da -da -da. Okay, so this is also St. John's wort dye, and you can't maybe tell in this picture, but that green color on the right is completely amazing. And the same plant that yields that also yields, as I showed before, um, 
this really pretty like red and maroon dye. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's amazing how different it can look based on the fabrics and the different ways you can do it. Um, we've got a couple of comments. Um, Liz, thank you for your interesting presentation. Your enthusiasm is inspiring and your artistry is amazing. Such beautiful <laughs> pieces. Um, maybe one day you'll have a show at PHA to display your work and we will be able to see some of them up close. I hope so. That'd be cool. That'd um, be fun. And some more thank yous. Um, and then one person echoed your recommendation for Dharma Trading Company. Um, she said they sell white scarves, ties, shawls, shirts, and skirts um, in cotton and silk. So it sounds like that has worked for other people as well as a source. Um, oh, and we have a question. Someone is wondering if you've ever tried rose hips. Um, I have not tried rose hips yet. I have this idea where I would really love to make um, like a scarf or something that I dye with all things that are very Martha's Vineyard to kind of get like a sense of place piece. And I would like to try using either roses or the rose hips from the rose that grows all over the beach, but I have not yet tried. Mm, that's a cool idea. Um, what are some plant materials available on Martha's Vineyard right now for those of us who are on the island that might be good for dyeing? Definitely goldenrod, any kind of goldenrod. And um, you can just do the whole plant top. So you can leave the green on there and it'll still dye really well. And it'll give you a bright yellow color that I actually don't love the yellow that it gives, but if you add the iron to it, it turns a really pretty green. So mm. you can do that. Um, there's acorns right now. Um, you can, I mean, geez, a lot of um, tree, like hardwood tree leaves will make a dye. Um, and that again, like you might just get like a, a nice brown dye out of it. Um, but you can add iron and it'll turn like a, a dark gray. Um, sumac is another one that's still going right now. You can either use um, the berries or the leaves. And that's one that it'll be yellow, but if you add iron, it'll be purple. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Um, I think that the... Um, Morella Pennsylvanica that we have also would probably do something similar to the sumac. Oh, and one, one tip is any sort of like herb or plant that has like a scent to it is probably going to yield a, a decent dye. And a lot of that has to do with like co-pigmentation and those secondary compounds I think help stabilize the dyes. So I did like an artemisia dye from just like the mugwort weed, like literally growing outside of my front door. And that also made like a lovely <clears throat> yellow and green, oh, which I originally had it included a picture of, but it looks like I must have taken it out. But yarrow is another one that you can make dye from and also makes lovely imprints, sassafras, um, if you find a gallium weed, you might be able to get some dye out of those roots. I mean, really, like, there's so much you can use. That's why it's such a shame that um, a lot of people aren't aware that outside of, like, onion skins or, like, buying some sort of exotic dye that you can't get results. But it's all about mordantine. It's just so important to mordant. Okay. Um, someone else's just typed in the suggestion of black walnuts too. Oh yeah, black walnut. We have one of those um, at Poly Hill. And I think you can get dye out of like any part of black walnut, but typically people use the whole of the fruit. And be really careful because it will stain your fingers and anything that it touches. Oh, what color um, dye does it yield? Um, it actually can yield like a yellowy or like brownish dye, even though it's going to like stain you pretty black. 
And then if you add iron to it, it'll get really, really dark. Like you can reach almost a black color with um, some of these. Okay. Like with the acorns, you can almost reach like a black color too. Mm, neat. All right, we've Especially got with silk, it's harder to get towards black when you use a cellulose fiber like cotton, but when you use something like silk, you can get closer to like a true black. Okay, cool. Um, a couple of similar questions. What would be the easiest and most common to find botanicals to try dyeing for the first time? Um, and what would be a good combination of easy fabric, mordant, and plant material to start with for a beginner? Um, I feel like there's a couple different answers I could give. So um, I have really enjoyed using like just like the dried up leaves, I feel like give even better results than fresh ones. And because there's so many tannins in them, you actually might not even need a mordant to like get results from it. So even if you're working with cotton, you could try using that. And what I do is like, I'll literally just grab handfuls of leaves. I leave the dirt on them and everything, it's fine. Um, just take a pot and you can, you know, do a little test, just like take a little strip of fabric to see how it'll be. Um, boil them in water for a little while until you see that the water is getting really like orangish and that'll give you something. Um, I know this isn't necessarily local, but like onion skins are super reliable and make a really, really deep dye. And I think we'll even attach, if you don't have a mordant, um, if you have marigolds around you, they always do an amazing dye. Um, if you want to do a mordant, I would say go to the store and get some alum from the spice section because as I mentioned, it's the same alum that they use on animal fibers. So if you do have something like silk, I would go to the store and get the aluminum sulfate. Um, you can also use that with the cotton, but if you use the aluminum sulfate, which is what the McCormick spice alum is, then you should do a tannin dip beforehand, which basically you could take something like acorns or sumac leaves or any plant material high in tannin, boil it so that you get some of the tannins out, and then just let the cotton soak in there for maybe a day and then mordant it with the aluminum sulfate. Or actually what would be even less complicated than that would just be to go to the store and get some soy milk and um, soak it in the soy milk overnight and um, then let it dry and then soak it again, let it dry and then you're good to go. And the soy milk, like I said, it can give variable results, but it's worth a shot if it's the least complicated thing for you right now. Okay, I like that you can get a lot of the um, ingredients you need at the grocery store. <laughs> um, for the onion skins, is it any kind of onion or red Yeah, onion? you can use um, orange skinned onions or you could use purple skinned onions. I don't think the white skinned onions do very much, although I could be wrong about that. Um, and onion skins will also, like if you add iron to it, will turn green, which is cool. Okay. But yeah, onions are great. Good to know. All right, well, we've got more thank yous coming in. Um, it looks like that is it for questions. Um, so like Liz said, um, we will put together a handout with some of the slides that have key information and email it out to all of you who've registered for the webinar for your reference. Um, and if you do have follow-up questions, feel free to email info at polyhillarboretum.org and we'll make sure your message gets to Liz. So thank you everyone. One more thing I just want to add real quick is yeah, if you totally. are harvesting like a seed or a berry from an invasive plant, be super careful about accidentally spreading that seed around or dumping any excess that you have outside of your house because you don't want to help that 
invasive plant spread. So if you have extra leftover, toss it in the garbage or burn it or boil it or whatever you want to do. Just make sure it doesn't <clears throat> get passed on to the outside. Okay. <laughs> um, good to know. And actually somebody commented saying that from their experience, the white onion does not work. So sounds like you were right about that. Yeah. Um, and somebody else is requesting that we email all of the slides. <laughs> so yeah, well. I'm sorry, I really had to rush through like the second half of that. When I practiced, I, I guess went a lot faster. <laughs> No, not at all. But um, yeah, there was a lot of great info. So um, we'll consider that request. All right. And there's so, so much more info out there. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Liz. And thanks to all of you who joined us. Um, I hope everyone has a great evening and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.